Welcome to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We are studying our way through this quarter's quarterly, and it's on the book of Isaiah. And it's deep and wide and rich. And we are joined by the quarterly author, Dr. Roy Gain, Professor of Hebrew Bible and Ancient Near Eastern Languages at the Theological Seminary at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Dr. Gain, great to have you. Thank you very much for joining me. Thanks. Good to be here, Pastor. Uh, it's very, very good to be discussing Isaiah with you. Yeah, these are great lessons. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled you wrote them, and I'm, I'm blessed by how you wrote them. And uh, I'm going to share the memory text because it's so good. It says, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. It's a verse I and maybe everybody have quoted, have, have quoted many times. Uh, the title of this week's lesson is Playing God. It says, this week, among other things, we'll take a look at the origin of pride and self-exaltation. And so when we get over here to Isaiah 13, which is where we begin, we ought to be thinking, oh, this is about to get interesting. Isaiah 13 has a heading that names Isaiah as the author. It seems also to begin a new section of the book. Okay, we're starting a look at oracles of judgment against various nations. So, why do the prophecies against the nations begin with Babylon? Dr. Gain, let me ask you that very important question. That is a very good question because what we would expect is that this would be an oracle against Assyria. In fact, Assyria is mentioned earlier in the book as being a major threat, the major threat. Um, but Babylon didn't become a threat until quite a long time after this, this time. It, it, took, it took a while for Babylon to, to conquer Assyria. And so why Babylon? As Isaiah is looking into the future. And then, in fact, the latter part of the book of Isaiah starting in chapter 40, is really all about, not Assyria in the time of um, Isaiah, it's really all about the uh, exile to Babylon and then the return from it. So this is um, indicating that, that ultimately the greater threat is going to be uh, Babylon. So here, the, the other reason for Babylon being so important is because of the nations, it was a, even during the time of the narrow Syrian Empire, Babylon was a huge cultural religious center from very, very ancient times. It was, it was a real leader in the ancient Near East and had been for a long time. And so, um, in fact, during the Assyrian Empire, Babylon kept rebelling against Assyria and Assyria would have to come in and take it over, conquer it again. There was one of the kings during the time of the reign of Hezekiah, the king of Babylon was Marduk Apla Idina. Uh, that is his Babylonian name. In the Bible, that is sort of transliterated as Merodach Baladan. And Merodach Baladan rebelled against Assyria multiple times, so they had to chase him down. And then ultimately he disappeared. But he is the one who sent, sent the envoys to Hezekiah in uh, the, near the end of uh, this section, this first part of the book of Isaiah, which is in chapter 30, uh, 39, uh, where he sent, sent the envoys after Isaiah was sick. So Babylon is looming on the horizon. It's going to become significant. But you realize that one of the major factors in Isaiah 40 and following, one of the major proofs that Isaiah cites, why we should believe, why those people should believe that Yahweh, which is badly transliterated as Jehovah, Yahweh is the personal name of Israel's God, which means probably something like, uh, it comes from the root to be, means something like probably he causes to be, which would be basically the creator. He's the one who is, was, is to come, and he's the creator. That's the idea. And Yahweh is the only true God, and one of the major arguments later in Isaiah is that he knows the future. He's the only one who does. And in fact, we're going to get a, we're going to get a um, prophecy in Isaiah 44, 28, and into the next few verses after that, in chapter 45, where Isaiah prophesies... Cyrus by name 150 years ahead of time. <clears throat> so already we have here in chapter 13, the fact that Babylon is so significant here is a great indicator that God regards 
Babylon, for one thing, has a great threat. We're going to see it in the future. But this is also because of the priority of Babylon here. We see that um, it makes perfect sense in light of subsequent history, which the people didn't know at that point. So God is proving that he knows the future. It's interesting, too, that God points out the destruction of this, of this absolutely mighty empire. In uh, chapter 13, verse 19, Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. That, that's unthinkable. It's like saying, one day in the not too distant future, New York City, no one will live there and no one will ever live there again. Imagine hearing that if you're a Babylonian, you'd think that's absolute craziness. But of course, that's precisely what ended up happening. I want to jump over to Tuesday with you and talk about Isaiah chapter 14, well, 12 through 14. Yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. You've got a point to add and, and, and then throw right back to me. Um, actually, this is not just what happened. What, what it looks like is that it's going to get nuked and all of a sudden Babylon is going to just be uh, flattened like Sodom and Gomorrah. That actually didn't happen like that. Um, it was a long process and I described that in the quarterly, how in fact when uh, Cyrus took over, the city of Babylon was preserved and it was still a very important city uh, for quite a long time. Xerxes damaged it in the 480s BC, but the city was still there and it just decayed over a long period of time until when the Roman Septimius Severus uh, went by there in 198 AD. This is 200, two centuries AD, okay, after Christ. Um, then the city of Babylon was gone. And today I have been to Babylon because my wife and I, my wife was a Mesopotamian archaeologist, and so we dug at Nineveh in Iraq in 1989. We visited the city of Babylon, and there are just some villagers living there on that site, but the city has never been rebuilt. So what really chapter 13 is doing is compressing all of this history uh, into uh, as if it's one rapid event. It actually occurred over a long period of time, but the result was ended up to be the same. Yes, yes indeed. Isaiah 14, we're starting in verse 12. We read this, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. This was, according to verse 4, a saying, a proverb against the king of Babylon. So let's talk about that. We point to this as uh, the downfall of Lucifer in heaven, uh, uh, of Satan. Uh, playing God is the title of this week's lesson. We're talking a look at, we're taking a look at the origin of pride and self-exaltation. So walk me through this. This is a very interesting thing addressed to a Babylonian king, but we take that to point to Lucifer and we talk about the origin of evil. Okay, to cut through the fat, what we've got here really is, yes, addressed to a human ruler, but, but, but behind that human ruler is a power that is greater. Just like, for example, in Revelation chapter 12, we find this dragon that is ready to devour the woman's child as soon as she gives birth. Who is that dragon? Who was trying to kill Christ when he was born? Well, Satan was, but who was he using? He was using Herod. And so here we find, yes, the king of Babylon, but who is behind that king of Babylon? Now, that term Lucifer is from really a, a Latin translation, but the Hebrew is Haleel ben Shahar, which means day star, son of dawn. So it's a, a beautiful a beautiful title, Day Star, Son of Dawn. I mean, it's just evocative of just a perfect creation that God made. And um, but, but when we look at the profile of who this is and what he says, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. Uh, I'll be like God. No Babylonian king ever said that or would even think it. They wouldn't dare. Not even in, uh, we find in the, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, we find the, the ultimate... Um, uh, really blasphemy and arrogance of Belshazzar, the last king of Babylon. He was the co-regent with Nabonidus, his father at that, at that time. And so even he, it says in that chapter, he was worshiping gods of wood and stone and all the rest of it. He wasn't saying, I will be like the most high. Not even him. Nebuchadnezzar looked out and he says, is not this great Babylon that I have built? He didn't say, I will be like the most high. None of them would ever dare do that because we know we have 
Babylonian writings. I've read them in the original Akkadian. I teach Akkadian here, which is the Babylonian language. How, how can you call people out of Babylon if you don't know the language, right? <laughs> and so here is, um, here is a personality that is beyond any, any human king of Babylon. It's got to be someone greater. Now, when we compare this with Ezekiel 28, we find that in, in Ezekiel 28, he was in Eden, the garden of God, and he was a covering cherub. Who is that? We, we, we find out by comparison with Revelation chapter 12, there was this great uh, dragon who is Satan, the deceiver, who was cast out of heaven. And that fits perfectly the profile of Ezekiel 28, which parallels this one here. This is the evil power behind Babylon. This is Satan. And notice here his, his name. Originally, he was created as Daystar, son of dawn. Son of dawn. Dawn is the time of light. Day star, that's giving light, and yet he brings, as a result of his sin, he brings darkness. Yeah, that's such a fascinating look, isn't it? That uh, Isaiah there pointing to a Babylonian king, really pointing beyond that and, and, and taking us to that place. I mean, it's a tremendous passage that we use again and again and again and talking about the origin of, the origin of evil. Uh, and so let me go to Wednesday. We've got about a minute. So really, we're just going to dip our toe in the pond here. You've called this, uh, this, this lesson on Wednesday, Heaven's Gate. Um, I'll just throw to you for a minute and let you take this and, and talk to me about where this day goes. In a moment, we'll come back and flesh it out a little bit further. Okay. Uh, in Genesis chapter 28, Jacob saw a ladder in his dream that was let down from heaven. And he called that place uh, Bethel which is house of God. He said, is this, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So here was God's revelation let down from heaven, giving Jacob hope. And there were angels ascending and descending. So it was access to the heavenly realm, to the place of God. It so happens that the name Babylon, which is the same in Hebrew as Babel, Babel, it's the same word in Hebrew, Babel, comes from the Akkadian term, Bab Eli, which means the gate of God or the gate of the gods. And, and that means that it's the place on earth where you access the gods. So they built these ziggurat towers like the Tower of Babel, trying to get up and access uh, and get in touch with the heavenly realm. So the gods would come down. And in fact, they believed that the god Marduk would come down and um, actually spend the night with their high priestess and so on at the top of that ziggurat tower in a ritual bedroom and so on. So this was uh, human works building up to try to access heaven versus the grace of God letting down the ladder. And of course, in John chapter one, Jesus said to Nathaniel, you'll see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. It's Christ who is that ladder. He is the great, great uh, gate to heaven. Not the Pontifex Maximus, which means great bridge builder that we find in Roman tradition. Um, Christ is the one who is the only, only bridge that we have to get to heaven. We can't build that up ourselves. And it really is boiling, to boil it down into a parable, it's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisee says, I'm uh, so righteous, I'm doing all these things, and I'm, I'm gaining all this by myself. Righteousness by works, gaining salvation. Whereas the tax collector says, no, I'm just a sinner, and he beats his chest in, in misery and in humiliation, and God then gives to him uh, what he needs. That's the opposite. Those are the two sides of works versus grace, accepting what God gives us versus trying to build it up ourselves, trying to be our own gods, to be like the Most High, like Satan tempted uh, Eve, the serpent, which was Satan, tempted Eve, saying uh, that you will be like gods, knowing good and evil. You can be like a little Lucifer. You can be like a little Satan. You can become like God. And that is the temptation that he wants to give to every one of us. You will be like God. And we have to resist that and say, there's only one God, and I'm going to follow him. Mm, it's a magnificent lesson this week, playing God. It's very, very deep. We'll have more in just a moment. Uh, this is Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. Your programs are amazingly educational and attractive to the generation who doesn't attend church. I am so happy that God brings his word to our homes when we can't reach a church. Thank you, it is written, for this incisive yet sensitive commentary. 
May the Holy Spirit direct many of my ex-army friends to these videos, and may they receive Jesus' salvation. Thank you for the morning devotional. It really helped ease my soul after dealing with an irate customer on the phone. Blessings to the ministry. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written with our guest, Dr. Roy Gain, who is the author of this quarter's Sabbath School Quarterly. He is a professor at the Theological Seminary at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. And I would like to point your attention to this book. It's good. It is the companion book that is designed to go with the quarterly. This is not the quarterly. This is in addition to its adjunct to, ancillary to. You'll get more from your study, you'll find insights in here that the author of our lesson did not have time to go into here. Different themes and different uh, subjects. Great stuff. The book of Isaiah. You can get that any old time at itiswritten.shop. In fact, not any old time. 24 hours a day, six days a week. Itiswritten.shop or other places where you buy your Christian reading materials. Dr. Gain, let's take a look at Wednesday. And there's an interesting question here. I'm going to read 1 Peter 5.13 where Peter writes, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, salutes you, and so does Marcus, my son. So here's the question. I want to hear what you have to say. Why does Babylon here later refer to Rome and to an evil power in the book of Revelation? Walk me through this. This is very significant. Okay, for one thing, when you're in a country um, that is hostile, uh, to your religion and so on. Sometimes you have to be careful and veil what you're saying. When my wife and I were in a, um, a particular country, I won't say what it was, we were doing archaeology, and uh, that country was hostile to the country of Israel. And so whenever we, in our, even in our private conversations, because we didn't know if we were being monitored uh, by, by uh, microphones or whatever, we always referred to that country of Israel as Disneyland. Okay, and uh, that, that way we protected ourselves. So when Peter is referring to Babylon, um, it could have to do with that. Certainly in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is very much against Babylon. If he had said that that is Rome right out, 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 uh, out front, he was on Patmos. He was a Roman prisoner, and that would have gotten him in a lot of trouble. Okay, so, but the other thing is that Rome really takes the place of Babylon in world history. It's very much like it. When we see in the prophecies of Daniel, we see the different parts of the great image in Daniel 2. We see the head and the chest and arms and then the belly and thighs. And then we see Rome. Rome is really continuing the oppression and the domination of these, this stream of great world empires. So it's really a, uh, an heir of Babylon. But more than that, ultimately, you see, I said earlier that Babylon was a great religious center in the ancient Near East. Their city god Marduk was very supreme, very important in the ancient Near East. They regarded him, in Babylon at least, according to the Enuma Elish Old Babylonian epic, as the king of the gods. And so um, Babylon was a, a really big religious center of, of, of opposition to God, religion, that's, religion that is totally opposed to God and his worship. And so Rome ended up being like that, even more than uh, Medo Persia and Greece, so that it was um, a, a power that was blasphemous, arrogant against God, persecuting his people, all of those things. And we see those things in the book of Daniel. We also see them in the book of Revelation, such as in Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, we find this Babylon um, that is um, described here. He carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. It had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, jewels, pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities of her sexual immorality. Now that makes perfect sense from an ancient Near Eastern point of view. This woman is clothed as a priestess or even as a goddess, and uh, sexual immorality, this sounds like it's related to the goddess Ishtar who was a god of uh, sex. She was the patron deity of prostitutes, and she was also a goddess of war. 
and she was one of the main deities in Babylon. In fact, if you go to the Pergamon Museum in the city of Berlin, as my wife and I have done, you can see that the um, attribute animal of Ishtar, which is the lion, is depicted on the si sides of the processional way uh, in bricks, colored bricks that were taken to that museum from the city of Babylon. Ishtar was one of the major old deities of that city. And then in verse 5 of Revelation 17, on her head, on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon, the great mother of prostitutes, just like Ishtar was the patroness, patron deity of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And then I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Ishtar was also a warlike goddess, very cruel. And then the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So this really then is pointing forward to a future time, which from the standpoint of the book of Revelation, this is within the, the so-called Christian era, when we have persecution, abominations, blasphemy, which is really repeating the kinds of things that were going on in ancient Babylon and that were related to the, uh, the character of the goddess Ishtar. Yeah, that's really fascinating, isn't it? Uh, so that very strong connection between Babylon, between Rome, and then we see Rome pointed out again in a more modern iteration in the book of Revelation. That, that's tremendously fascinating. The new Babylon um, bearing a lot of sway and a huge amount of influence down here in the end of time. Well, I want to read Isaiah 28, 21 and come to a question that, I, for me, it's not a question, but I mean, it's a question. So Isaiah 28, 21 says, For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. You ask the question here. It's in the context of the final triumph of Zion, Thursday's lesson. Uh, you ask the question, does God really destroy the wicked? And I want to read what you've written here in the lesson. Look at Isaiah 28, 21, where God's work of destruction is his, his strange deed. It is strange for him because he doesn't want to do it, but it is nevertheless a deed or an act. It is true that sin carries the seeds of self-destruction, but because God has ultimate power over life and death and he determines the time, place, and manner of final destruction, this is interesting, it is pointless to argue that he ultimately terminates the curse of sin in a passive way by simply allowing cause and effect to take its natural course. I would shout hallelujah. Um, it's odd to me that this has even become a question. Uh, if it wasn't a question, it might still be a question because we are caused to look at it here in the context of the book of Isaiah. But what a funny old thing, this idea that we question whether or not God really destroys the wicked. What do you make of that? And how do we explain this in a way that may be palatable for at least most? There are theologians and a lot of people these days, including theologians with um, tremendous publishing records and degrees behind their names, who are arguing that um, really God has to be a certain way because uh, they take part of his depiction in the Bible, such as in say, the Sermon on the Mount, and they say that's what God is like, and anything that really departs from that is uh, not in harmony with what God is like. Besides, if God is love, and then we know what God, love is, and they define love what love is, and then God must be like this. And that really rules out things like, for example, the ancient Israelites uh, at God's command, wiping out the Canaanites and things like that. So what we really end up with is a designer God. And I know this because I have um, discussed this with, um, with some folks who have had tragedies in their lives and their families. They have lost loved ones, and they desperately want to believe that their loved ones uh, are going to be saved. And they will uh, grab onto any theology, um, any, um, particularly if it comes from a reputable theologian, who tells them what they want to hear, that God is going to save everyone. No matter what, what happens, no matter what their choices are, God is going to save them because God is love. And because we know that love means God always has to be kind. And that rules out destroying uh, the wicked. There is a problem with that. And the problem is that we learn about what God's love is from the whole Bible. The whole Bible. And this is part of the Bible. And so are the stories in the Pentateuch and Joshua about the Israelites and the Canaanites. And what we discover from the whole Bible is love includes not only mercy, but also justice. What's the use of having 
mercy if you don't have justice. Remember the case of Rosa Parks in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, 1955, in December, and she was sitting on a bus, and she uh, didn't move when some people with a lighter complexion got on the bus, and she was taken before the judge, and the judge could have said, I'm going to have mercy on you. Did Rosa Parks want mercy? She didn't want mercy. She wanted justice. Without, without justice, um, then we're in deep trouble. So what God does is he gives justice, ultimately, and that means that people will have the results of their free choice. Now, could you imagine if someone hates God, they want to be selfish, they're, they're, they want to be like, uh, they, they want to be uh, ruling over people, oppressing them, doing all kinds of bad stuff, committing adultery, all over. that's the way they want to live. And then they're taken to heaven and it's all pure, it's beautiful, it's holy, everything is like that, it's totally different. Heaven would be hell for them and God is not going to subject them to that. God respects our free choice. He allows us to have the results of our choice. And ultimately, yes, God does allow cause and effect to take effect. And in, in fact, in uh, Daniel 5.23, Daniel said to Belshazzar that God holds our breath in his hands. So <laughs> he is allowing us. He's our life support. See? And if we pull our life support, it's, it's all gone. Now, if we pull our life support, does that mean that um, who, who is the one who is responsible for our death? Is it the one who is controlling the life support or is it us? You know, it's complex causality. It's really, really both. But ultimately, a God is in charge of everything and he allows us to have choice. But yet, yet uh, the results of that choice can be destruction. And it says his work is strange here in this destruction. He doesn't want to have to do it. He's not willing that any should perish, according to Peter. He doesn't want to do it. He's screaming at us, even to the point that Ezekiel's wife died just as an object lesson to those people, uh, that their temple was going to be destroyed. Repent before all that happens. God was screaming to his people, and yet they didn't listen. And so they had to, yes, have the results of his strange work. It's a strange work. I've often wondered if, if someone has any question about that. Just ask Uzzah. If God uh, destroys the wicked and, 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 and uh, punishes, penalizes their misdeeds, I think it's pretty straight from the Bible that these are sorts of things that we should just put away and, and accept as fact. Hey, thank you, Dr. Game. That's all we have time for. This has been a fantastic lesson. Next lesson, lesson seven, the defeat of the Assyrians. We're gonna get into that and enjoy it. I hope you will join us for that. This has been Sabbath School. I appreciate you being part of this. Join us again next time for more Sabbath School on It Is Written TV.